Raging Inferno. I'm sitting out on the road in front of my own house where I've lived for 13 or 14 years. And it's, it's going down in front of me. The roof is falling in. It's in flames and there's nothing I can do about it. And, and the flames are in the roof. And, ah, uh, God damn it, it's just beyond belief. I, my own house and uh, everything around is black. There are fires burning all around me. The Language of Advertising a. Hello there. My name's Steve Newman, but I expect you know that. I have to entertain a lot. That's one of the problems of living in Beverly Hills. And after dinner, I always give my guests Max Caffeine Instant Coffee. Steve, this coffee's marvelous. It's so fresh. Where do you get it? Glad you like it, Raquel. It's my secret. B. I'm standing in a laundrette in Bromley, Kent. It's Monday morning, and I've just asked ten housewives to do half their wash in fizz detergent with its new XR74 foam booster, and half in another leading brand. Well, all of them agreed that fizz with new XR74 washed whiter, cleaner, and fresher. Fizz with XR74. For families, use fizz. For families, use fizz. C. A country walk. A summer's day. The man you love. Somewhere to sit. The sky is blue. Your love is new. Make him happy with a Macbeth cigar. Macbeth with a masculine aroma of carefully selected tobaccos. D. Do I have to stay in bed? Yes, dear. You've been ill. Sick children are always a problem. Help to give them energy and vitality again with Glucosone, the sparkling health drink with added vitamins and minerals. E. Did you enjoy your meal, sir? Thank you. May I have the bill? Here you are, sir. Hmm. I see. Uh... You take credit cards? Well, sir, that depends. Which card is it? It's an International Streamline Platinum card. Oh, in that case, of course we do. Thank you very much, sir. And, madam, do come again. F. Are you looking for a car that's prettier than a Polo, faster than a Ford, mightier than a Maestro, cheaper to run than a Renault? Then you're looking for the new BM Calypso. Phone your local dealer for a test drive, and if you buy a Calypso this month, he'll give you a free radio, a full tank of petrol, one year's road tax, and free number plates. G. All right, I went up the pub last night. They didn't have my favourite beer. Run out, they said. Have some of this Burgermaster Lager, they said. What I said? Lager? Not for me. Go on, try some, they said. Well, I had a glass. Didn't think much of it, but I had another. Load of rubbish, I said. Try another, they said. I did. Awful, I said. I don't believe it, they said. Try another. This is the worst beer I've ever had, I said. Try another, we'll pay, they said. Now it's rubbish, I said, and staggered off into the night. <laughs> I was laughing. Five free glasses of Burgermaster. And it's not that bad. H. Don't forget, Johnson's January sale starts Monday the 28th of December in Johnson's stores in Bournemouth, Southampton, Portsmouth, Brighton and Canterbury. Johnson's January sale, 9 o'clock on the 28th. I. I want to talk to you tonight about a very personal problem. Foot odor. Do you suffer from smelly feet? I did, until I discovered Malcolm's talcum powder. Now I don't walk around smelling like a piece of old cheese. Remember, for a talcum, say, Malcolm. For a talcum, say, Malcolm. J. Hi, Sandy. I love your hair. I've just washed it. Mine is always so dry and unmanageable. Yours looks so clean and natural. That's because I use Aerial Conditioner. It's naturally balanced for dry hair. It's been tested for years, and it's safe enough even for a child. I'll try some. Can I borrow yours? Buy some. You'll be surprised. It's the cheapest on the market. Britain from the air. 
Salisbury. Salisbury was one of the earliest new towns. The city was founded in 1220 to replace the town of Old Sarum, three miles to the north. Old Sarum had been founded by the Romans and developed by the Saxons, and was already an important town in the 11th and 12th centuries. The water supply was poor, though, and so the town was moved to its present site, where smaller rivers join the River Avon. The most striking feature is the cathedral, which was founded at the same time as the town. It was built between 1220 and 1258, and is thought to be one of the most beautiful in Europe. The spire is 404 feet high, making it the tallest church in Britain, and was added in 1334. The cathedral is 473 feet long. Salisbury is a market town for the surrounding agricultural area, and a shopping centre for the large numbers of military bases to the north of the city, on Salisbury Plain. It's also a tourist centre, because of the cathedral and old town, and because of Stonehenge, which is ten miles north-northwest of the city. It's situated in central southern England, about 30 miles inland from the south coast, and 83 miles west of London. The city centre is particularly pleasant, as a ring road takes heavy traffic away to the east. Carnarvon Carnarvon is the usual spelling, that is, C-A-E-R-N-A-R-F-O-N nowadays, although older maps use the English spelling, C-A-E-R-N-A-R-V-O-N. As it's the centre of the area of Gwyneth, which is 75% Welsh-speaking, the Welsh spelling is preferred. Gwyneth, by the way, is G-W-Y-N-E-D-D. It's situated in North Wales and has always been an important strategic and military site. The Romans built a castle here in AD 78. The present castle was started by King Edward I in 1283 and completed in 1322. His son was born here in 1284 and became the first Prince of Wales. Prince Charles was invested as Prince of Wales at the castle on July 1, 1969. The castle at the top left is one of the finest surviving castles in Britain. The old town wall is still in good condition. The population is 10,500 and the town is a market centre and a tourism centre for the Snowdonia National Park. There is no railway, the nearest station being at Bangor, nine miles away. It's famous for sailing and fishing. Sea and river fishing are both excellent which adds to the town's attractions. Durham Durham, in County Durham, is in the northeast of England, about 14 miles from Newcastle and 260 miles from London. It is built on a bend in the River Weir, and it grew around the Norman Castle, which was built in 1072 to protect England from the Scots. A wall blocked off the peninsula. The cathedral was begun in 1093 and has been called the finest Norman building in Britain, if not in Europe. The religious schools developed from the 15th century onwards, eventually becoming the University of Durham in 1832. It is England's third oldest university, after Oxford and Cambridge. Durham is an administration and market centre, and although it is surrounded by coal mining villages, it has remained reasonably quiet and beautiful. The present population is 24,777. Liverpool Liverpool is one of Britain's largest cities. The city population is 605,600, but the population of the Merseyside conurbation is more than one and a quarter million. Its most famous inhabitants are probably John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison and Ringo Starr, and Liverpool has built a one million pound Beatles museum. Its fame in the world of football is as widespread as its fame in pop music, with Liverpool Football Club being the most successful European team of the late 70s and early 80s, winning the European Cup three times. However, there's a lot more to Liverpool than just music and football. It developed very quickly in the 18th and 19th century as Britain's major Atlantic port. It was a centre for the cotton trade and manufacturing industry, 
as well as a centre for ships taking part in the infamous slave trade. At one time there were seven miles of continuous docks along the River Mersey. The river is crossed by two tunnels, a railway tunnel built in 1886 and a road tunnel, the Mersey Tunnel, in 1934. For many years ferries were the main way across the river, which has no bridges at this point. There are also two twentieth-century cathedrals, one Church of England, the other Roman Catholic. The Catholic Cathedral, one of the few in the world built with an underground car park, can be seen in the lower right foreground of the picture. The famous Lime Street station can be seen just right of the centre. Liverpool is a cosmopolitan city, and to the anger of both the Irish and the Welsh, it has been called the real capital of Ireland and the real capital of Wales because of the large number of Liverpudlians of Irish and Welsh descent. Today it is well known for the wit and humour of its people and its high unemployment figures. There are plans to attract tourism to the area and to the northwest generally by converting areas of Dockland into leisure areas, parks and museums. The Town That Is Going To Die You can take either the Kedawi route or the Clanevi road. Kedawi is the better road, but the Clanevi way is shorter. It's up to you, really. I'll tell you the short way anyway. Go about two miles up this road until you get to Clanevi. Just after you leave Clanevi, you'll see a turning on the left, the B4007. Keep going along here for about two miles or so, past the Tradawi mine on your left. Go down the hill into the town and you'll come to a roundabout. Turn left, past the post office and go on to the next junction. You'll see a church on the other side of the road. Bear right and carry on to the next fork in the road. Take the right fork and look out for a little road, it's a track really, on the right. It's easy to miss it. Go a hundred yards or so up the track and look at the field to your left. That's the site for the reactor. Collector's Corner. Good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of Collector's Corner. For this afternoon's programme, we come to visit 16-year-old Adrian Shaw. We're in Adrian's room at the moment, and we're completely surrounded by bottles. Yes, bottles. Big ones, small ones, blue ones, green ones. In fact, it's difficult to see the walls at all. There are so many bottles. How many bottles are there, Adrian? 1,429. 1,429. Have you counted them? Yeah, this morning. I thought you might ask me that question. And are they all different? Yeah. I keep my spares in a box in the shed. How did all this start? About three years ago, I was fishing in the river and I found a bottle. This one here. And I'd never seen one like it. So I took it home, cleaned it up and showed it to my granddad. He said all the bottles were like that when he was my age. I've never seen one like it. No, my granddad's nearly 70. It's an old beer bottle. Mm. Anyway, granddad said it might be worth a bit of money. So I took it along to this shop my mum knew, where she'd seen old bottles in the window. And how much was it worth? Well, the bloke in the shop offered me six quid for it. It's a pretty rare one, because it's got the name of the brewery on it, and it was only a small brewery. Weren't you tempted to sell it? No, not really. I told him I'd think about it. I saw one in a catalogue the other day. I could get 15 quid for it now. But I wouldn't sell it. Anyway, I like it. And where did you find all these other bottles? Not all in the river, surely? No, though rivers are good places to look, especially near bridges where people chuck them in and they get stuck in the mud. Where else, then? Rubbish dumps, usually the ones out of town, you know, where they used to bury all the old rubbish. And how do you know where to find these dumps? A lot have been built on, haven't they? Some have, but not all. You can look at old maps in the library, or you can ask old people. They can often remember where people used to chuck rubbish. And, of course, it doesn't cost anything, does it? No. I've never spent a penny on a bottle. Though you can buy them in shops, a lot of people do. Do you ever sell a bottle? Oh, yeah. But only if I've already got one the same. You know, I sell one and keep the other. What did people keep in all these bottles? All kinds of things. Medicine... You find a lot of old medicine bottles. They're usually blue. But there are all sorts, really. Beer bottles, ink bottles, all shapes and sizes. Tell me about that green one over there. What was that used for? Oh, that was used for... 
sequences. Car wash. Brian was extremely proud of his car. It was his first new car after years of second-hand disasters, and he had saved long and hard to get it. He remembered the day three months previously when he had walked into the showroom to order it. The salesman had been helpful and friendly, and Brian had enjoyed every detail of the transaction. Having had a test drive, he had sat for over an hour poring over the list of options. Yes, he would have metallic paint. No, he wouldn't bother with an electric aerial or electric windows. Certainly not at a cost of three hundred and fifty pounds. Yes, he would have the deluxe sheepskin seat covers and so on. When it was eventually delivered, gleaming to his door, he had been almost afraid to drive it. That was three weeks ago, and the gleam had gradually become dulled by dust. It was the hottest summer in living memory. It was time for its first wash. Brian drove carefully to the automatic car wash at a nearby service station. He was sure that passers-by must be admiring his beautiful machine. He drove in, got his token, and joined the queue. At last, it was his turn, and he pushed the token into the slot and carefully positioned the car in the centre of the car wash. He felt a bit apprehensive when he looked at the huge green brushes, but he wound down his window again and firmly stabbed the start button. There was a loud whirring noise as the brushes descended and the spray began. Brian tapped his fingers in time with the song on his stereo FM radio. The radio, it was working. That meant the aerial was up. Brian turned to look. Too late. There was nothing he could do. Wait. Better close the window quickly. Brian grabbed at the winding handle in panic. There was a slight cracking noise, and Brian found himself staring down at the handle. It had broken off in his hand, with the window open. He felt the first fine spray on his face, and he had time for one last longing look at his sheepskin seat covers before the deluge of detergent and water hit him. Urban legends. The hook. A boy and girl were sitting in a parked car late one evening, listening to the radio. Over the radio came an announcement that a crazed killer with a hook in place of a hand had escaped from the local insane asylum. The girl got scared and begged the boy to take her home. He got mad and stepped on the gas and roared off. When they got to her house, he got out and went around to the other side of the car to let her out. There, on the door handle, was a bloody hook. The vanishing hitchhiker. Well, this happened to one of my girlfriend's best friends and her father. They were driving along a country road on their way home from the cottage when they saw a young girl hitchhiking. She told the girl and her father that she just lived in the house about five miles up the road. She didn't say anything after that, but just turned to watch out the window. When the father saw the house, he drove up to it and turned around to tell the girl they had arrived, but she wasn't there. Both he and his daughter were really mystified and decided to knock on the door and tell the people what had happened. They told them that they had once had a daughter who answered the description of the girl they supposedly had picked up, but she had disappeared some years ago and had last been seen hitchhiking on this very road. Today would have been her birthday. The Mouse in the Bottle Two old ladies stopped at a restaurant to have lunch. They ordered their lunch and asked for two bottles of a well-known soft drink while they were waiting. The bottles were made of green glass, and they each poured themselves a glass. They were chatting away and drinking, and one of them finished the first glass and poured another. She noticed something in the bottom of the bottle, but couldn't make out what it was. She tried to get it out and finally succeeded. It was a decomposed mouse. They both fainted and had to be revived. Anyway, they sued the soft drink company and got thousands of dollars. Prejudice. Right. Well,、um, my name's、uh, Don Crabtree, 
and uh, I come from Headingley in Leeds. I'm a I'm an insurance salesman. I'm working for the Ribble Mutual Widows Benevolent Society, and I travel over far four hundred miles every week in my work, uh, which doesn't leave me much time for a hobby. But I do like um, I do like a drop of real ale. Oh, hello. Um, my name's Dora N. Twistle, and um, I'm from Liverpool, and. Uh, I work in a factory life, and I've got three kids and a husband. Hello there, I'm uh, Angus McPherson from Glasgow, which is in Scotland, of course. Uh, Morag, my wife, and I have eight children, so it's quite a large family. And uh, I have a general medical practice in the town, so uh, I keep pretty busy. Uh, my name's Gwyneth Jones. Uh, I live in Gwent, which is South Wales. Uh, I'm a housewife with two children, um, and my husband's uh, a minor. My name's Wayne Roberts, and I come from Birmingham in the Midlands. I work in a car factory, and I like to play football at weekends. Uh, I got married last year, and we got a little girl aged four months. We'd like to have a boy next time. Well, I work as an assistant matron at Budley Salterton Infirmary. That's what the locals call it. I live in Exeter, which is in Devon. Oh, my name is Jill Carpenter, and I've got three children. There's not a lot of work in the area, so most of my cases are, well, some of the lads from the farm with agricultural injuries, that sort of thing. Hello, my name's uh, Laurie Morrison, and I, uh, I'm from Whitley Bear, which is up near Newcastle in the northeast of, of England. I'm unemployed at the moment, but uh, me, uh, me hobby's playing football and, and watching it on the telly like. My name's Tracy Sparrow, and I come from Hounslow in London. Um, I work in a shoe shop in Richmond High Street. Um, I never really go away on holiday, because, well, I just think London's the greatest city in the world, and I wouldn't want to leave it. Making your point. Jenny McPherson is the managing director of GB Electrics. She's talking to a marketing meeting. Now we come to the most important item on today's agenda, that's item 7, the GB Express coffee maker. I think all of you have reports for the meeting, yes? Well, we'll hear them in a moment. I haven't seen them yet, and so I'll make my remarks as brief as possible. I'd just like to point out a few problems. Over the years, coffee consumption in Britain has been increasing rapidly and is now around the same level as tea consumption. That's the good news, if you're selling instant coffee. During the same period, coffee has become a weak, warm liquid with little flavour or taste. In other words, coffee has become more and more like English tea. You know the joke about our canteen here. How do you know which is coffee and which is tea? The tea comes in blue cups. <laughs> when we began selling filter machines, our initial sales were low. On the other hand, the profit per machine was high. And what is more, sales have doubled in almost every year since then. The British public are slowly beginning to develop a taste for real coffee, by which I mean filter coffee. Our new machine, or so I've heard, is a great improvement. Imported machines from Italy and Holland are beginning to sell well, and unless we make a positive move, we'll be too late. The public will identify espresso coffee with imported machines. After all, they are an Italian invention. From another point of view, we could say that a British manufacturer will not do well in this market, and that we might be safer to promote our filter machines, which of course are considerably cheaper. The last thing I want to say before hearing your reports is that I still have an open mind. It's up to this meeting to come to a conclusion either way. The Parkhurst Talkabout Good evening and welcome again to the Michael Parkhurst Talkabout. It is now some years since the government introduced the Sex Discrimination Act, which was intended to ensure equality of opportunity for men and women. We wondered whether the Act had been successful, and our four guests tonight are discussing the general question of equality of opportunity. Bernard Blackburn, journalist and broadcaster. In my opinion, we shall never create real equality of opportunity by making laws about newspaper advertisements. You know, you have to advertise for a salesperson nowadays rather than a salesman or saleswoman. I'm not saying that these things are unimportant, but basically... Uh, by the time children get to four or five, they have already been conditioned into their social roles. It starts in the cradle. 
Girls in pink, boys in blue. I heard about an experiment a few years ago where they took a small baby and dressed it in blue. Then they asked several mothers to play with it. They bounced it up and down and tickled it and said things like, You're a rascal, a real little devil, and Ooh, what a big strong boy you are. And they laughed when it yelled and shouted. Well, then they dressed the same baby in pink and got another group to play with it. They cuddled it and said, Aren't you pretty? What a lovely little girl. As soon as it got noisy, they tried to hush it and calm it down. Now, that's where sexism begins. And that's long before we give the girls dolls and toy saucepans to play with and give the boys cars and guns. Hmm. Helen Grant, University Lecturer. I feel there's a long way to go before we can talk about equality of opportunity. Men still expect their jobs to take priority. Even where both partners work, too many men still expect the woman to cook meals and do housework. I mean, go into a supermarket at lunchtime. It's full of working women giving up their lunch hour to do the family shopping. How many men would expect to do the same? They're probably spending the lunch hour laughing and joking about women. The same old tired jokes go on forever. Women drivers, mothers-in-law and sexy secretaries. Secretaries, that's another absurdity. Imagine an office where a man and a woman are doing similar jobs. She's called a secretary, he's called a trainee manager. Of course, this is how so many firms avoid obeying the law on equal pay by altering the job description. The media, as always, I'm afraid, is so much to blame. Magazines, TV, film and advertising portray women as sex objects, not people. Women are blackmailed into buying useless products because they might fear they're unattractive without them. Too many of us accept the stereotype and waste our time worrying and dieting to fit some imaginary male ideal. Mm, mm. Dr. Alice Lee, a general practitioner. Equality, yes. Well, I'm a doctor, so I suppose you could say that I have an interesting, rewarding and important job. However, I have experienced tremendous prejudice from male colleagues. And after all, while there are plenty of women doctors, most of the surgeons and top consultants are men. The argument's always the same in all spheres of activity, that women will leave the job to have babies. Of course, not all women want to have babies, so this is tremendously unjust. Personally, I did want children. I've got two, and I stopped work to have them. Children are always forgotten in the argument. I've always felt that it is a very narrow view of life to value a person purely in terms of job status. I believe we should remove the barriers against women at work, but I also do not see myself only as a working person, Dr. Lee. Being a mother is a very important social role, and we need to reassess our view of motherhood and to regard it as equally valid as any job. It is absurd to think a woman is more successful as a prime minister than as a mother. Of course, this is equally true for men. Couples who have swapped roles, where the mother has gone out to work and the father has stayed at home, will tell you that both jobs are equally important and even that being at home is more demanding emotionally and physically. Hmm. Rosemary Valentine, romantic novelist. Perhaps I come from a different generation. When I was a girl, things were quite different. I enjoy having doors open for me. I like it when men stand up as I enter a room and make sure that I'm seated before them. I feel that the romance has gone out of life today. I used to love getting dressed up for a party, having my hair done and so on. I never felt inferior, just different. I wouldn't want my husband to help me in the house. And I'd feel strange if he did. I also can't worry about all this fuss about words. We're supposed to say chairperson rather than chairman. I don't dislike it, but I don't see it as terribly important. I think my husband is a typical example of a male chauvinist pig. But I like him that way.